Good to see Grace, Grace back from the beautiful Philippines. Uh, beautiful place. I think I'd like to go back there myself. I've been there twice. Beautiful. Um, but it's good to see everybody. Hope you had a, a good week. Um, today is March the 3rd. Is that pretty awesome? Wow. It means absolutely nothing. It's just psychological. Uh, we, we know we still have five months of winter left, you know. But wow, I think spring is what, in two weeks. I forget the official date of spring, um, but it's coming. Time change, you know, next week we're going to be extra cranky. Did you know that? We're going to lose an hour sleep next week. So it'll be spring forward, you know, one hour. So it'll be nice getting dark at a little after 7 o'clock. So I don't know what we're gaining every day, two, three minutes um, of daylight. But hallelujah. All righty. Well, today we're going to talk about one of the most interesting verses in the Bible. Did you get your handouts? Um, we're going to be talking about one of the most interesting verses, um, Romans 8, 28. And I say it every time, not every time maybe, but most of the time when I talk about Romans 8, 28, it's a verse that we like to quote to other people. It's not a verse that we like quoted to us. Because when somebody quotes Romans 8.28 to us, that means we're going through the hard time. You know? But we don't mean to discourage people using this verse. This is supposed to be an encouraging verse. Okay? To realize what? God is in control. And, you know, sometimes we fail to realize that, even as Christians, you know, even though we trust in the Lord with all of our heart, lean not to your own understanding. In the flesh, sometimes we just forget that. And so things come into our lives, kind of just smack us, uh, just hit us hard. And when the dust settles, we wonder what in the world uh, just happened, you know. Um, is God still there? Does God still love me? I mean, how did God let this happen, you know, when it seems like some wicked people just don't get cancer, right, live to 90, uh, on and on and on and on. This is not fair, right? So sometimes we don't say that with our lips, but we feel it in our heart. Like, what in the world is going on? But, you know, um, uh, Solomon teaches us that good things and bad things happen to us all. God sends rain upon the just as well as the unjust. God allows trials to come into our lives. And it's like the psalmist said, um, when God's done, when these problems are over, I will come forth as gold, right? I think about Ron Hamilton. He wrote that famous song, you know, a.k.a. Patch the Pirate. Um, Rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes, you know. And that's hard to swallow sometimes if we're being honest, you know. But God doesn't make mistakes. He has a purpose and a plan for everything. Which leads us to our scripture. And we know. Wow, look at those th first three words. And we know. What's that have to do with? Confidence. Right? Paul said one time, being confident of this very thing. That he that began a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So we're just trusting that. But let's pray before we dig in. Father, I pray that you will use this scripture. Just a very interesting scripture. Perhaps one of the most interesting scriptures in the whole word of God. And, and Lord, because it deals with problems, it deals with trials and tribulations. And Lord, we have those moments of doubt and and Lord, we think about this verse, and certainly it brings comfort to us. And I pray that you will help us as we look at this verse today. And I pray that you will help us to be reminded about how powerful it is 
and how helpful it is when we go through these valleys of the shadow of death, Lord. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's look at it again. We know that all things work together. Notice that word together. It's like a puzzle. You get that puzzle, you open the box. Wow. Does it look like the picture on the cover of the box? Man. It does not look like the picture on the box. It is a jumbled mess. But then you take a piece and you put all the flats. You know, I don't know how you put together a puzzle. You look for those four corners. You look for all the flat pieces, get that frame done. And then, man, you just keep putting it together. And guess what? Slowly but surely, that puzzle will begin to look like the cover of the box. Right? But it's very time consuming and it takes a long time. And if you're if you're like my house, if your house is like my house, boy, it's a challenge because if you don't put it together real quick, the grand the grands come over and just you're you get that puzzle done and you're missing ten pieces and boy there's nothing more annoying than uh you look for that one piece, it'll drive you insane. You you go through all that trouble putting that piece together. One piece is missing, and you about lose your salvation over something like that, you know. Um, but anyways, just like that puzzle, work together. It all works together. And then this is a part we have a problem with, this very next phrase, for good. Wow. This is where our faith really, the rubber really meets, meets the road. For good. All things, this is probably one of the most disputable, disputable, most disputed scriptures in the whole Bible. How could that be good, what happened? Well, here's the thing. We're not God. We don't see the whole picture. It's just kind of like in the airplane. You get up there, get a different perspective. You look down, wow, man. This looks different than it does down here. See, down here we have all these blocks, these walls. So many blocks, but you know, God doesn't have that, you know. And so God knows what he's doing. We just have to trust him again. And then hence, that's what Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. And that's the hard part. We know that all things... Work together for good. For who? For everybody? It's not what it says. That's point number one, right, that we're going to look at. To them that love God. To them who are the called. Now here, look at this phrase. According to his purpose. So God has a purpose. And what is that purpose? To conform us to the image of his son. That is the purpose of God. Think about that. Don't lose sight of that. God's purpose for our lives is to lead us to the image of his son. Now, what's our purpose? Well, um, you know, have it easy. Let's be honest. Our purposes are about having it easy. In life, at work, right, with our church, we want everything easy. We want everything to go smoothly, right? Um, is that reality? Is it reality for everything to go smoothly? No. So look at verse 29. For whom he did for no. He also did predestinate, right? Wow, that's a big word. Foreknowledge and predestination. A lot of people fight and argue over those things, right? But foreknowledge and predestinate. But what did God, in God's foreknowledge, what did he predestinate for us to do? To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among 
many brethren. Realize this, God allows every circumstance to come into our lives for our betterment. Think about that. God has a purpose for every circumstance that comes into our lives. And what is that purpose? To make us more like Jesus, right? And to make us stronger. You're not going to be made strong, right, without um, resistance. Resistance is what builds strength. Doesn't matter, uh, man, you're, 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 you're working out. What causes the human body to get stronger? Uh, resistance. And so, uh, in our lives, you look at those areas that made your faith stronger, that, that made you stronger as a person. It wasn't those times going downhill, sliding, using no effort, you know, just rolling. <laughs> It's when you struggled. It's when you went uphill. It's when that resistance made you stronger and stronger and stronger. It's kind of like the man. Um, he had a dream and that there was going to be a big rock outside his house, and he was going to move that rock. So sure enough, next morning he gets up, and there's a huge rock. He's like, wow, just like my dream. And he began to push that rock. Man, this is what God wants. He, I had a dream about this, and he couldn't move it. And he kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. He's getting frustrated. God, why did you give me that vision about moving that rock? Now I can't move that rock. Now I'm frustrated. I'm angry. But nonetheless, he kept pushing it. He kept believing. He kept pushing it and pushing it pushing it. And you know what? He didn't realize by doing that, what was he doing? He was getting stronger and stronger and stronger. It gave him a purpose. Gave him something to do, even though it's hard. Even though he's never going to accomplish it, right? But nonetheless, he thought it was a failure. The whole thing was a failure. But guess what? God taught him a lesson. He learned this, this wasn't necessary to move this rock, right? It was to make me stronger. So God will put things in our lives sometime, uh, and we'll get frustrated. We think, man, I failed. But no, you didn't fail, right, if you keep going. But what that resistance, that failure, it just helps to make you, you stronger. I think about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, you've probably seen billboards, different things. Uh, one thing Abraham Lincoln is, is famous for, well, it's the Civil War, freeing the slaves. Also, he's famous for failure. I, I don't have the statistics right here. But, man, he failed. Uh, ran for office, failed, right? Business, failed. <laughs> Failed, 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 failed. Then he became what? Man, a great, a great man, a great statesman. Wasn't perfect, but he did a lot of wonderful things. And all those failures made him who he was, right? Uh, Edison, all those failures, the light bulb, right? All those failures, all those failures, what do they do? Well, they gave you all kinds of knowledge, made you stronger, Right? Really made him a better, better scientist. Right? And he took that failure, and they asked him one time, hey, aren't you discouraged? Never been able to do this. You know? And one time in particular, I remember the story, he, he had a big press conference, and all the people were there, and, and he, he lit this light bulb up, and it only burned for like seconds. And they were so disappointed. And they asked him, they said, aren't you disappointed that it failed again? He said, oh, it didn't fail. It only, it only burned for like seconds. But guess what? I learned something else that doesn't work, right? And that's what he did. So he looked at his failures as a minor success. You say, well, that's a mind game. Well, call it what you want. But that's what he did. And so our failures aren't total failures <laughs> because what we learn from it and it makes us stronger. Now, what if we don't learn from it? <laughs> wow. Well, the book of Proverbs would call that a simple person. <laughs> a simple, uh, uh, and we haven't done that yet on Wednesdays. Um, and um, we haven't talked about the simple yet. But the simple, they just don't learn. 
Uh, they just keep going on and keep doing the same thing over and over again. But anyways, God allows these circumstances, these trials to come into our lives to help us uh, to be more like Jesus. You see, again, God sees the big uh, picture. I'm going to read this to you. It's in my teacher's edition here. But um, these verses that I just read to you, uh, sometimes they've been called the A to Z of the Christian life. And I'm going to read from A to Z. It's an acrostic. But these verses should give us the attitude of hope, boldness to face battles, courage to do what's right, defense against the devil's attacks, encouragement during trials, focus on the eternal, right? And by the way, focus on the eternal. That's one of the biggest things about this scripture because we won't know why it was good many times on this earth. But when we get to heaven, I believe God will help us to see, okay, that's why that tragedy happened. And it may not just be for you, but it's other people, right? Because sometimes we make everything about ourselves, right? And it's not always about ourselves. But anyways, it helps us to give glory to God. It helps us in time of need. It gives us insight during trials, right? Can help us to have joy through circumstances, knowledge in the darkness of what God's trying to do. Love for God. That's a big one because sometimes when bad things happen, we lose our love for God. Well, if we believe this verse, it helps us to realize God does love me. Even though God has allowed this bad, terrible thing to come into my life. Uh, ministry for others, and I just touched on that. Sometimes we make everything about ourselves. I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. But everything's not about us. Sometimes God will do things through us for somebody else. Right? The, the Bible talks about that. Paul talks about it uh, for our examples, for our end samples. Right? Um, you know, and Nice and Sapphira. They lied. They sold a piece of land. They wanted to be like Barnabas. They wanted, they wanted accolades. They wanted pats on the back. They wanted to be like Barnabas. So they sold a piece of land, just like Barnabas did. They, they lied. They said, we brought all the money. Here it is. They didn't. They just brought part of the money, but they wanted to think, people to think that they were just like Barnabas. Well, God killed them both. You remember that? And God doesn't kill all liars. I'm so thankful for that. But God chose to kill them. And the Bible says, great fear came upon the church. So is that fair? Why would God kill these two people and many other people like Dave, like David, for instance? You know, he did he did something worse, really. I mean, as far as sin goes, but God didn't kill him. Why did God kill them? Well, sometimes God will just make an example out of people. I don't understand why. I don't I don't know why God does God does what He does. Again, foreknowledge, right? And He predestined. Right? And I, I don't understand it all, right? Um, and we won't. We won't understand it until uh, we get to heaven. So sometimes God does things for other people to see, right? Um, so what he does sometimes, nutrition for the famine of blessing to feed us. Offering of praise, purpose of our lives. And boy, we see that uh, quality for our lives. Um, that, that's an interesting one. You think about quality. Um, sometimes we think um, the rich and famous, so to speak. That man, what a quality of life. You know. Man. To live like that. Have your own airplanes and all this kind of stuff. And then you hear some of them have to get shots and take medicine just to fall asleep at night because they're depressed or because they can't even sleep. They have no, no or drugs. They get no enjoyment from all the things we see. Like, wow, if I had that, what a life. But a lot of the people that have that, 
what? They're not happy at all. As a matter of fact, they're very, very miserable. And sometimes they famously meet an early death. Many, many, many examples of that. Um, but what is a good quality of life? You know, just to be rich, just to have it all, you know that. I mean, you might have a lot of fun, but w that doesn't mean you're going to have a quality of life. You know, somebody that's poor might have a higher quality of life. And so we, we think about some of these things. What is quality of life? Rejoicing in suffering. Man, to rejoice in suffering. Man, that, that's tough to do. Uh, how about, how about Job, you know? He lost everything. He said, naked came I into this world, and naked I'm leaving. Praise God. Wow, Job, are you crazy? Um, a strength not to faint. A testimony to other people. Understanding, that's a big one, to give us understanding. Victory in the valley. Wealth as children. X-ray vision into why God does stuff, right? Even though you may not always see it. Yieldedness to do his will and zeal. Zeal uh, to serve. You know, we're all going to have those valleys in our lives. But, you know, maybe sometimes God has us go through the valley. And then sometimes we're going to have those Mount Everest. We reach the summit, you know, I think about Walter Payton. I used to love Walter Payton for a lot of reasons. Played for Chicago Bears. Chicago Bears stank royally. I mean, they stank all the time. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, they had a good team, and they won the Super Bowl. I think it was 1984 or something, 83. What was it? 85. Yeah, 85, 85. Yeah, they had the fridge. Remember the fridge? That big number 72. Uh, uh, Perry, Walt, uh, his name was William Perry. They called him the Fridge. In the Super Bowl, they gave him the ball as a running back. He scored a touchdown. I'll never forget that. But, uh, but everybody was so happy for Walter because he was, he was just, I mean, as a matter of fact, Walter was so special, they even named an award after him called the Walter Payton Award. That is the reward award for humanity. Uh, they do good things in the community. Well, they call that the Walter Payton Award. But anyways, Walter Payton... And he's a born-again believer. I've, I've read his testimony. I've seen his testimony. Um, but they asked him, he's, he's, he's going off the field, and Walter, is this everything you thought it would be? You finally did it. And in his humble way, <laughs> kind of like Barry Sanders in a lot of ways, he just kind of was like, you know, he wasn't impressed. You know, he won that Super Bowl, and yeah, it was kind of neat, but it's kind of like, is this, is this it? And so that's human nature. Uh, you reach those summits, you do those things, and there could still be a big empty hole inside of you, right? So what's going to fill that? Well, you're, you're, that's, what's, your, what's your destiny? <laughs> what does God want for you? Uh, those Super Bowl Super Bowl trophies, all those other things, you know, you're not going to take that with you, right? And so what does the Lord want uh, for your life? So God has a purpose. So first of all, this promise, just three thoughts in this lesson this morning, main thoughts. First of all, this verse is for believers, right? All things work together for good. For who? To those that love God. Does that mean God doesn't care about these other people? It doesn't mean that. It means that God is working in the hearts and the lives of his children. So this is a promise for whom? For God's people. For his people. Uh, part A, this, is, this verse is not for the unsaved. All right. Now, Full disclosure, do I believe God works in the hearts of the unsaved? Oh, yeah. We see that with Paul. God was working, convicting. God said it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Boy, that's weird terminology. What's that mean? It means that it was getting very painful for Paul 
to kill these Christians. Very painful. Every time he did it, ouch, you know. So God was leading him to salvation. So that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about particularly this verse. It's not for the unsaved. It's for the saved. How do you know that? Well, obviously we read it. All things work together for good to those that love God. That means that thing, people that belong to God, that verse doesn't apply. They don't have that promise, right? Because they don't belong to God. They're not one of his children. So that's why it's important uh, just to help people become one of, one of his children. Uh, I think about Judas, right? And th that verse is in our lesson there, Matthew 26, verse 24. The Son of Man goeth that as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Okay? It didn't work out for good for Judas. All right? Um, and that's an example right there. Okay? Um, Matthew 7 is pretty powerful as well. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven, right? There are professors and there are possessors. Not any, but everybody that professes Christ is saved. Only those that are saved that possess. So there are professors and possessors. Um, so we need to make sure that we're not a professor, right? Now, possessors also are professors. They profess Christ, right? But that does not mean that all professors are possessors. And this verse is very eye-opening. Not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And so, that's important. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name, here's a, here's a key phrase, have done many wonderful works. We've done a lot of things. Do we get to heaven by doing a lot of things? No. We get to heaven by believing trusting by faith it's by faith not of works right ephesians 2 for by grace are you saved through faith not not of yourselves it's a gift of god so that this is telling me there's a lot of people trusting in a lot of things to get to heaven other than christ and that's sad jesus said in john 14 6 i am the way the truth the life nobody no man nobody gets to heaven except by me Matter of fact, in another scripture, he says, um, if you try to get in any other way, you're a thief and a robber. And you're not going to break into heaven. You're not going to climb in some back window or uh, back door. No, there's just one door. Jesus, Jesus is that door. Uh, this verse is for the saved, part B. Right? Uh, predestinate. Wow, that's the first time we see that word in the New Testament. Okay, he, Predestinate. God knows everything. I like what it says here. He foreknew whether or not you would receive or reject his son. And based upon your free will and his foreknowledge. Right? So Calvinism. Wow, that's a big thing. Calvinism. There's a lot of, a lot of people that, that lean towards Calvinism. And I get it. I think all of us have a little bit of Calvinism in us. Right? But the extreme part, or called hyper-Calvinism, is when you say salvation is 100% about God and nothing to do with man. That's what extreme Calvinism says. Extreme Calvinism says if God wants you to be saved, you're going to be saved, and you have nothing to say about it. Now, I know that that's saying it extreme, but that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's salvation is all about God and nothing really about man. If you're one of the chosen, you're going to get saved, whether you like it or not. Um, 
I do believe God knows who's going to get saved. Right? Go down to the desert. There's a man there that needs to be saved. A beautiful example of what I'm talking about. The Ethiopian eunuch. God told Philip, I want you to go down there and I want you to witness to him. And he's going to get saved. And he got saved. Right? Now, does God do that for everybody? Why did God do that in this case? Because he was in it. He was searching. He was seeking. Draw an eye to me, and I'll what? Draw an eye to you. You've probably heard the terminology, I wasn't looking for God, but he was looking for me. Right? And there's truth in that. But, truth be told, whether you knew it or not, God knew you would be searching for him. You know what I'm saying? And I know this can be confusing sometimes. Um, we have to be careful that we don't get to extremes. That's what this whole thing is about. Um, yes, God, by his foreknowledge, he knows who's going to be saved. Does that mean he damns some to hell? No. God is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. But God knows. And I firmly believe with all my heart when that last person gets saved, God said the harvest is over. That's it. And so what do we do in the meantime? We keep going. We keep shining the light, keep giving the message. And then one day, that last person, who's it going to be? I don't know. But God's going to say the harvest is complete. And boom, we're going to be out of here in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Right? But anyways, um, how did I get off on that? But anyways, it's his people. It's God working in his life uh, and, and our lives. And, and again, we can't cherry pick. I am who I am as a result of my life experiences, good and bad. Right? As a pastor, as a husband, as a father, right? as a human being. I stand you before, before you today who I am because of a, all my experiences is who I am, right? Now, you cherry pick those experiences. Well, I take out all the bad. Now I'm not who I am anymore, you know what I'm saying? And that's not life, right? We are who we are as a result of our experiences. And some things we would like to remove. But if we remove all those things, then we're no longer who we're supposed to be. Paul, how about Paul? Man, he, he lamented over those experiences. As a matter of fact, he even said, I'm not even worthy to be an apostle. Because I persecuted the church. I did this, I did this. I did. Wait a minute, Paul. You can't take that away. Right? Because without those things, you wouldn't be the apostle Paul. Right? So am I, am I saying praise God for all the terrible things we've done? No, I'm not saying praise God for all the terrible things we've done. I'm saying, guess what? All those things make us who we are. Right? And we can't change it. So what do we do? We can do one of two things. We can lament. We can, we can sit and... I wish I could go back. Many people have wrote some famous songs about that and got very rich writing songs about going back. You can't go back, right? So what do we do? We just go forward, right? And you don't focus on that. That's why Paul, Paul better than most said, forgetting those things which are behind, they're part of me. I can't deny it. It's who I am, but I'm not going to focus on that and sit and be depressed about it. Now, he did sometimes, but he snapped out of it, right? And he's helping us to see, man, don't focus on that, right? Forget those things which are behind. Press toward the mark for the pride. 
Who, who knew that better than Paul? And that's what he tries to do is to encourage us. Again, it's like those different pieces of that puzzle. Separately, it looks like a jagged mess. But together, wow, it forms a picture. Just like that recipe. Well, chocolate chip cookies. Mm, I like me some chocolate chip cookies. You'd have probably never guessed that. But you know what? You, you, you look at those ingredients. And go ahead and eat you some flour. That's nasty. Go ahead and eat some raw eggs. Right? No, some baking soda. Ooh, that's really bitter. Right? Even those semi-sweet chocolate chips or sweet, whatever you use. But you know what? You put it all together, mix it all up. Wow. That recipe. Man, it's something good. And that's what God does in our lives. All things stirred together. All things mixed together. Work for what? Good. So God allowed those things, those ingredients to come into your life to make you what? To make you good. Right? That's who you are. And all those experiences, God can use you to help other people. Just like God used Paul to help a lot of people because of his own failures. How many times do we look at Romans 7 to encourage ourselves when Paul struggled with his flesh, when he said, the things that I want to do, I don't do, right? I don't know how many times I've sat in my office and said, I don't know why God allowed you to have a miscarriage. I don't know why God allowed this. I don't know why. But I do believe that God can use this, right? God can use these things in your life to help other people, right? Well, I'd rather God didn't do that. I don't know why God allows happen, things to happen in our lives. But wouldn't it be a shame if some things happen in our lives and it didn't work for good? That it would be for naught. So these things that happen in our lives, we need to help God make it for good. All things work together for good. But it's not going to happen if we become angry, depressed, despondent. That's what the devil wants. Then that tragedy is not going to be for good. But God can use it for good if we work with God. If we trust God. If we allow God to help it to happen. Right? And so when trials come, don't be disheartened by them. Don't be destroyed by them. Realize, hey, you know what? God can use these things. You know who some of the people that God uses the greatest are the people that reach the lowest depths? I mean, whether they teach on finances. Who, who often teaches on finances? Uh, people that have wrecked their lives financially. <laughs> and like, like David Ramsey type people. He learned some things. And so he began to teach other people, right? And now that's just one person, but you can, you can find lots, many, many, hundreds of thousands of examples, right, where people had this issue. I don't care if it's being, being big and overweight, and all of a sudden now they go around teaching other people, helping other people. So these things in their lives that almost destroyed them, drugs, whatever, I don't care what it is. They almost destroyed them, so now they're using it for good. That very thing that almost destroyed them. Wow. Now we can see a little bit of all things work together uh, for good. Um, conformity as its goal. Conformity. And we talked about that. We touched on that. Um, the goal is to make us stronger, to make us more like Christ. Just like the early illustration I gave about the rock, the man. Uh, man, I know God wanted me to move this rock. I had a dream about it, a vision about it. So every day he goes out there trying to move it, trying to move it, and it failure, failure, failure. But in the midst of that failure, he doesn't realize he's getting stronger and stronger. Right? And so we don't know what God's doing. All things work together for good. To those that love God, uh, who are called according to his purpose. Right? Um, but now we have number two, his promise. Just let me give you these. We're about running out of time. All right? His promise. What's his promise? 
of the outcome. All things work together for good. Now, he needs our help on that, <laughs> right? He needs Paul's help on that. He needs us to partner with him for it to come out for good. Not, not always, okay? But for, for the most sake, he needs us to answer the call, right? And so his promises are true. Part A, certain, certainty of out, outcome. And we know, right? A change in its curriculum. That one's a little different. But what's that talking about? God takes us through many steps. And that's what curriculum does. Curriculum has a starting point and an end point. And it has steps in that curriculum. I don't care if it's math, English, whatever. It builds that curriculum builds. So in our lives, God builds. And he keeps building to make us stronger. A change in its curriculum. Now, who wrote the curriculum? Here's the key part. And we'd like to change that chapter. We can't change it. It's part of God's curriculum for our lives. And we can't change that curriculum. Right? It's those steps of God perfecting you and making you who he wants you to be. Because you're not going to be who God wants you to be with just all sunshine and roses, you know. Um, so, and then lastly, purpose. His purpose. Realize that. God has a purpose. I love Isaiah 55. We mention it m m many times when we're talking about this kind of thing. Um, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are easy life. Everything good. Those are my thoughts. Those are my ways. My choices. Man, I just want everything to be smooth sailing. God says, okay, but that's not going to make you stronger. Right? That's not going to make you who I need you to be. So, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Again, perspective. God's way up there looking down at the whole picture. We're so limited. I'm so limited right now. All I can see is where I am right now. I can't see what's going on in that hallway. I have a little glimpse of those little skinny windows. Right? I don't know what's going on anywhere else except for this room. I'm severely limited. But God knows all things. God knows what's going on all the time in everybody's life. God knows. And boy, I see that sometimes. Being a pastor, I see what God does sometimes. Man, I didn't know why that happened, but later I realized, oh, I can see why that happened. You know? I, and the same thing in my, my marriage, my finances, my children. Uh, you can see it after the fact many times, but while you're going through it, you don't, you don't see it. That's where faith comes in. Where you say, hey, God's got, God's got it. God's in control. God knows what he's doing. I don't know why this happened, but God has a plan. Many times you don't see it till later. Many times you won't see it till you get to heaven. And that's, again, where faith comes in. Um, our filter. What is our filter? To see everything through the lens of God, right? That's the filter. And so, um, very important point right there. Um, and then part B, our focus. Our focus should be Jesus, right? Looking unto Jesus. So when you go through that valley, that problem, um, rather than let that problem consume you, focus on God. God, why did you let this problem teach me, help me? You know, that's why the psalmist said, I shall come forth as gold. When I'm tried, when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. And then our faith. It'll help strengthen our faith. Right? All right, that's it.